Okay, here's the first bit of advice I'm teaching, because I've often taught in this room. Get the lighting right. I never realized there's such beautiful lighting in the room, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I realized it, but they don't actually turn on the lights, these lights. So I, I should really have a piano here, and I should be <laughs> singing you, uh, shouldn't I? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice, you know, a sort of mulled wine and, uh, you know, cocktails and uh, yeah. for the next one, right, if it's still raining, anyway. Um, anyway. Um, Good afternoon, and uh, my name is Enda Duffy, and I'm uh, from the English department. And I'm, I'm, I'm completely honoured to be invited to do this, and I'm quite scared, to tell you the truth. If you see me circling around this thing the way that... Do you remember Donald Trump during the second debate? <laughs> 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 You'll understand, but eventually maybe I'll sit on it. Maybe I, maybe I could pull it a little to one side, something like that. Um, forgive me a minute while I get my... My, my nerve together. Um, I, I think what I will be doing is um, a little, uh, perhaps not strange, but um, directed to um, humanities teachers in particular. And excuse me if, if I do that too much, but anyway, that's where we're going. Uh, what I promised you is a talk about uh, truth, but what I'd like to add to truth is uh, beauty. Okay, so um, they also asked me to sort of think of 20 minutes where I would just talk to you and then 20 minutes more where we would sort of have some exercises. But I thought what I'd do is I would sort of uh, flip that around and we'd sort of start with the exercises. And because I wasn't sure what else to do, like any nervous teacher, I brought a handout. Do you have the handout? <laughs> right, so there's another bit of advice. Work on the lighting and always have a handout. Ooh, that is too loud, yes, that's better. Um, so. Uh, what I would like to do to start is I would like us to read a poem, okay? And um, so I'm, I'm showing, not telling, okay? Right, this is what we do in the English department. And the poem is A Bright Star, it's called, and it's by an Englishman, a very young Englishman. He died in his early 20s uh, named John Keats. He died in the 200 years ago, the beginning of the 19th century. Um, do any of you know it? One or two people know it anyway, yes. Okay. Um, what I would like to do is read it first, but please don't get too relaxed. Okay. <laughs> so, let me just tell you the story in case you don't know it. John Keats, see there's an area over here where the reverb begins. If I stay out of it, it's okay. Uh, <coughs> John Keats um, was a young, he was a medical student, he was apprenticed to a doctor, and uh, um, he was one of the few English poets who wasn't actually an aristocrat, I suppose. Although, as you'll see, he was still not doing too badly. Um, and he was started writing poetry. And uh, he had a brother, an older brother. And the brother in London contacted a disease called tuberculosis. And the young medical student, the same age as our students here, if you're here, um, nursed him through it. And his brother died. And of course, he got it too. And in those days, tuberculosis was a death sentence. Okay? So what he was told, or what he knew, was that the only possible way to get better was to go to a warm country. And so he and a friend, a very generous friend, went with them. They decided they would go to Italy. Okay? And to make a long story short, he had a girlfriend. Her name was Fanny Braun, sort of the love story of his life. And of course, he left. And this poem was written on the ship on the night he left England. He was out on the deck of the ship. And he had with him a book of poems by Shakespeare, of Shakespeare's sonnets. Okay? And on the flyleaf, you know, the blank page at the beginning of the book, he wrote this. He looked up at the night sky and he saw the star. And he wrote a poem, Bright Star. Right? Okay? And should I tell you the sad ending to this tale? He went to Italy, it right, they, had a, they had a little apartment, they had a room in a house overlooking the Spanish steps. You may have been there. And uh, there he died a few months later. Um, <coughs> so this is a love poem, and it's a sonnet. And I want sonnets are these little square poems on the page, like little boxes, and there's thousands of them in English. And you know what? This might be the best sonnet ever written. So even if you take no 
already I've given you this incredibly, it was well worth your coming here today. <laughs> <laughs> Advice and teaching is cheap. This stuff is really expensive. Uh, so you are getting a complete gift right now with this possibly the best sonnet ever written in the English language by John Keats, Bright Star. And I hope I can do it justice. There's, there's two difficult words in it, I'll tell you first. Otherwise, they're, it's all totally simple. One, two, three. The fifth line is the word eremite. That just means hermit. And in the next line, there's a big word ablution, which just means to wash yourself. Okay? He also uses thee and thou because he thought that was very kind of romantic at the time. Okay? But don't worry about that. So he's talking to the star. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art. Not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round Earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains or the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable. Pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath and so live ever, or else swoon to death. Do you see what he does? He talks to the star, and he shows you the star looking down at the world, and he gives you like the whole universe, you know, and the snow, and the night time, and the tides, right? And that's going to last forever, and he's going to die in a few weeks. But, but he gives you the whole universe, and then he kind of zooms in, you know, pillowed upon my fair loves, ripening breast, to feel forever its soft swell and fall, awake forever in a sweet unrest. You know, it's, it's so simple. And do you see, should I show you some more? Well, no. Oh yes, I'll show you one other thing. Still, still to hear her tender taken breath. Okay. So this is a love poem. You've all been in love, right? Or you want to be in love anyway? One or two of you? <laughs> Some of the grown-ups have gone through it many times. They're, 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 <laughs> they're looking at me with weary eyes. <laughs> well, you want to anyway. You love somebody, right? You saw the professor with the two dogs. Come on. There's, you know, there's a lot of love, right? Um, but, but that's, that's really, you could say, that's, that's his formula. That's his love formula. You know, that's his definition. Still, still to hear her tender taken breath. That's all you need. You know, so you, can, you can try that now. Do you love somebody? Who do you love the most? Do you love that about them? Still, still to hear her tender taken breath. You know? But it's even better because think of tuberculosis, you know? what it is. It's a disease of the lungs. You can't breathe, you know? So he was aware of the breathing. But that's, all, but I mean, it's truly amazing. That is the definition. Of, that's all love is. Loving, just watching the breath of the other people, person. And the whole poem just gets reduced to that. The poem itself is just like, like a breath, right? So, are you all beautifully relaxed? What you're going to do now on the count of four is you're going to sit a little bit straight and you're going to put this breath inside your lungs, right? And you're going, you're going to read it back to me, okay? And while you're reading it, you're going to think of the people you love and so on and so forth. So just, will you do that for me? Come on, don't just sit there, you know, I'm not playing the piano up here, <laughs> right? You know, the poetry is just sound. It's just melodious. You know, it's just sound, right? And where's the sound coming out of your throat? So you, you deserve to have this poem in your mouth. You deserve to have it in your chest. And of course, you know, you deserve to, 
to express your own tender taken breath because you've got a tender you deserve to be loved as well okay on the count of four are you all ready to go you could even look in with somebody else and sort of you know do some kind of muzzling if you want it uh, okay i'm going to count to four and you'll start with bright star you do the whole thing it's gorgeous come on you can do it you can do it and <laughs> one two three four Oh God, 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 let's do it again. <laughs> okay, you're not at, you know, you're not in, in some really dreary church service, right? <laughs> this may be the greatest sonnet ever written. <laughs> Sit up straight, give yourself a, you know, fill that chest of yours with some air, right? Okay, <laughs> one, two, three, four. And he's still, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I asked him to sit up straight. Is he sitting up straight? No, he's not. One, two, three, four. Not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, Pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast to feel forever its soft swell and fall, awake forever in a sweet unrest, and still to hear her tender taken breath and so live ever or else boon to death. So, my mic popped off. There we go. Thanks very much. Um, okay. So, have you ever loved that much? Wouldn't that be the first? This is falling off again. It's my big ears, apparently, but they're too polite to tell <laughs> me. <laughs> um, anyway, think about it. I mean, we could, you know, I could stop right there and I pretty much giving you the, all the lesson I want to give you. The rest of it is just sort of a little few explanations drawn from that. Now, you came here for some teaching advice, right? Okay. So what did that have to do with teaching advice? Uh, well, um, I can give you tons of teaching advice. Should I get that out of the way next? Yeah, why don't I? Um, I'll give you four or five pieces of teaching advice that will be invaluable for you and, and so on and so forth. Number one is, um, do you ever use eye clickers? Bring them up to the front of the room, get a break, smash them. That'll be good. That's number one. Uh, <coughs> what about scantrons? Okay, if there are scantrons used in class, you are insulting not just the students, but yourself. Right? Get rid of those two. No teacher will ever remember you as inspiring for using either eye clickers or scantrons. Trust me. <laughs> they will forget about you. Right? You are sort of you are making their lives sadder and more miserable. Get rid of both of them, <laughs> okay? Third of all, and I'm just giving you, this is really good advice. Your ESCII scores will rise. You will enjoy reading them again, those comments. Uh, the third one would be something like, um, avoid, you know, the, 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 the bureaucracy kind of wants us all to be policemen in the classes. Fight that on every occasion, you know? Plagiarism has even some things to be said for it. Don't pile up the beginning of your syllabus with three pages about, you know, against plagiarism, right? Don't be the police person if you can avoid it. No teacher will ever thank you for that. No student will ever thank you for that either. Okay? And by the way, while I'm, while I'm on my sort of nasty power kick here and insulting everybody, they will never remember you for the quality of your PowerPoints either. No matter how carefully and beautifully concise they are, they will completely obliterate them out of their heads after, after your last class. So don't worry about those either. You'll do fine without them if you want. Okay. So can I give you some positive advice about teaching now that I've told you all the things not to do? Right? <coughs> Here's a line. Here's a formula that you can remember and you'll, to make you a great teacher and get you, you know, make you popular. Make them laugh. Make them cry. Make them wait. Put that down. That was actually Charles Dickens describing how you could write a successful bestseller. Make them laugh. Make them cry. Make them wait but it absolutely applies to teaching as well. And I think Dickens would have been a very good teacher. Um, 
The truth of the matter is, I mean, I could give you five more pieces of advice like this, and they are all pretty much worthless. You all know them already in your, if you think about it for two seconds. I mean, it's a lot harder to tell you seriously what brilliant teaching is. I mean, not that I particularly know, but when I've seen it in teachers of my own, it is really, really difficult to, to express and, and even, of course, more difficult to capture and um, replicate. But I can give you a few thoughts, and I don't know if any of them I did already in the first few minutes, but just let me try to um, explain to you. The first one would be, I would say, if you're teaching the humanities, always present them with the beautiful. Right? Always give your students beauty. Right? You are beautiful, you are good looking, the person next to you isn't too bad looking. Um, <laughs> you know, beauty. Like, don't, don't ever, I mean, how would I put it? Always present them with the most beautiful thing. Because, look, at basic, especially in the humanities, but not just in the humanities, in the sciences too. Talk to mathematicians, they always talk about the beauty of what, what they're doing. Uh, <coughs> in the sense that, you know, their lives afterwards, these kids, and, the, and our lives, and their lives before they come here, are filled with so much garbage and rubbish being given to them as messages. You've got a chance to present them instead with what you believe to be truly beautiful. Take that opportunity. And then the stuff will literally, like Bright Star, teach itself. I swear to you. And it doesn't ma I'm not just making a claim for like high culture and John Keats or anything. If the craziest country music is your thing and that's what's beautiful to you, you know, give them that, would be my thought. Believe yourself that it's beautiful. And I think you'll be halfway there. Okay. I better keep moving. Of course, you can say to me, what does that mean? How would we know if it's beautiful? Well, one sort of test of it would be something like this, that, it's, that it always turns out to be simple. If you follow what I said about beauty, you will realize that what you're presenting to the students is also simple. And again, we as teachers have this sort of temptation to always imply that the stuff we're presenting is difficult, and we, of course, are the people who can kind of unlock the thing for them. If you start out with the assumption of simplicity, you're, you're halfway there as well. Um, <coughs> I mean, what I do with these poems, for example, is I make them memorize. I don't just get them to recite. I get them to recite often enough so that they learn it off by heart. Think about, you know, you should all memorize Bright Star this evening, right? You, you, could, memorize, you could recite it put it on your car playing repeatedly, and after 40 times you would know it. And then you would have that piece of furniture in your mind for the rest of your life. Right? You could retrieve it when you need it, when you are finally in love with the person whose breath you're wa waiting for. You know, you could retrieve it. Right? Fill, it, fill your life with the beautiful. But even more, and this is slightly, and this is definitely for humanities teachers, what I would suggest is that always you try to Give the students a sense, you know, I could quote you of, of, the word I want to use is value, but I could quote you um, Oscar Wilde, you know, the cynic is the person who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, right? I mean, in many ways, what you should teach your students to do, forgive me for saying this, and I'm a bit nervous having it recorded, you should teach them to discriminate. I don't mean to discriminate, obviously discrimination is one of the worst words in our vocabulary. Not that kind of discrimination. But to know the value of one kind of writing or one poem or one... We do this all the time ourselves. You go to a movie. You say, that was good, that was rubbish, that was middling, or that was truly brilliant. That's all I mean. The brilliant one is the beautiful one. Right? That's all I'm trying to talk about. Always give them, if possible, the beautiful one. That's not hard, is it? Right? Um, but to also ask them, I mean, diff the problem I think often in humanities classes is we sort of, we don't ask them, well, to have those same kind of judgments they would have at any movie they go to watch or any piece of music they listen to, you know? Sort of ask them, did you prefer that poem or that one over here? Now explain to me why. In other words, that they will learn how to, to know value when they see it. Not price, but value, right? And I think we don't do that half enough. Um, now, what does all of this have to do with what's supposedly the topic of my talk, which is teaching truth? Okay. You want to hear a little bit about truth? Truth is even bigger and harder word than beauty. But 
you all actually know each other? No, I won't start the introductions right now. <laughs> Just looking at people and thinking. Okay. For, for the really literary types, you know where I'm leading with this, do you? No, you probably do. I'm going back again to John Keats, this poet. He wrote, he was always had this, you know, it's very easy to write poems, by the way, you all know. You just choose a bird, a tree, a pot, an ocean, you just address them, right? That's a poem. So, <laughs> the bright star, he talks to the star. In another one, he talked to a pot, a, va a, a vase, as we say in California. And uh, he talked to the vase, and <laughs> he wrote a poem, and it ends with the very famous line, beauty is truth, truth's beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. So in a way, that's all I have to say to you about that. That before you have the truth, you need to have the beauty. You know? In other words, never, I would, my advice would be, never sort of teach the concept. Never say this piece of literature or this piece of art or this exhibit is useful to use in my class because I'm making some point. Start with the beauty. Start with the work. Start with the thing that can possibly move them and relate to their own lives. Right? You know, that they can possibly be moved by it. And once they're moved by it, just like you watching some brilliant movie and you're moved, then you'll have an insight. Does that make sense? Um, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. Uh, <coughs> so I truly believe that, you know, before the truth, you need the beauty. Uh, so my, I tell this to students all the time. You know, people say they don't do the reading. Well, that's one problem. But the bigger problem, they really need to do something a lot more. And best, the best teaching, at least in the humanities, gets them to do it, and it's very hard, is they need to read it to the point where they're moved by it. You know, it's one thing to read it, and you get the meaning, goodbye, we go to the next one. That's the absolute last thing you should do with a poem or a novel or a film or anything. You know, I get the concept, oh, it's all worked out, goodbye. I can get an end exam. What you need to do is get to the point where it... Listen, these poems are some of the greatest poems in the language. They've moved millions of people who weren't all dumb, right? They can move you, but you have to almost, that's what education is. You educate yourself to that point where even though, you know, ska has never been the music you listen to, if your roommate keeps listening to it for a whole term, you will be educated and you will have the taste to be moved by it, right? And that's, once you're moved, insight is possible. There's some access to the truth. Well, anyway, that's the central thing I want to say about humanities teaching that we need to do. But I want to explain to you a bit more about the truth in the few minutes I have and before you all walk off again. Because the fact of the matter is, and I want to shift gears here, so you can move about and do all those things if you want for a second. Don't worry, I won't get anybody to recite again. Uh, but, yes, let's talk about the truth. Because, okay, what is this poem, really, that I just read you a while ago about? Well, it's actually about this disease, tuberculosis, right? Does anyone have any? See, I'm the, the nerdy teacher who thinks he knows it all. I actually know quite a bit about tuberculosis. Do you want to hear a story? I'm kind of embarrassed. I have one friend here in the front row who's looking at me like, oh, no. Do you want me to tell you? Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. I think I'll tell you. This is the story about my mother. My mother actually got tuberculosis years ago. It's called TB. And she survived it. That's how I happen to be here. So, should I explain? Yes. It was after World War II. She was just the age of our students here. In fact, she was younger, right? And she came from a little farm in Ireland. And like many other Irish people, she emigrated because there was no wall between England and Ireland, by the way. The English wanted Irish labour. Okay? So she went to England and she ended up in a town called Cheltenham. And Cheltenham is famous for a posh girls' school, but she wasn't in the posh girls' school. She was in a factory where they made clocks. She sat at a bench and she put clocks together and put them in a box. Okay? But she was very ambitious. You know, she wasn't educated like you guys, but she was ambitious. And ambition in those days for a young Irish woman, woman, like a lot of women in different parts of the third world still, means becoming a nurse, right? If you're, you know, now it's Filipina nurses or whatever in America, in England too. 
So she applied for nursing, and she was admitted to one of the best hospitals in England, which is called Great Ormond Street. It's beside the British Museum, it's still one of the world's famous hospitals. And she went there, and the first thing she had to do was she had to have a medical exam. And they gave her an x-ray. And when they gave her the x-ray, they said, there's a shadow on your lung. And the shadow on your lung was TB. Now, this was this wonderful hospital in Britain had just set up the NHS. Did they keep her there? Did they say, we will heal you? No. They gave her a ticket and sent her back to Ireland. And almost certainly a death sentence. Actually, not just for her, but because it was very infectious for the whole family in the little house they all lived in. Okay? So she went back to Ireland, but two good things. She had two bits of luck at that moment. The first one was an Irish politician named Noel Brown, who basically tried to bring in a health service in Ireland for poor people. And the church and all the politicians were against him. But, you know, just, it was like Obamacare. It was exactly the same in a way. He did manage to set up some sanatoria, which only rich people would go to before, did, you know, go to before that. Do you think anyone suggested to my mother that she should go to Italy or Spain? Although it was 100 years after Keats, they didn't even think like that. But she did get into one of these new sanatoria with all the other young guys and, and women who had TB and they were all dying around her. But in 1944, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, a doctor named Waxman, right, um, developed, discovered an antibiotic called streptomycin. And this, Noel Brown in Ireland, got some of it for these Irish sanatoria. And they used to drink it, it was like Guinness. They used to drink it in these big, big glass jars every day, this brown liquid. And she had to have an operation and a big piece of her lung was, one of her lungs was removed. But she drank that stuff and she recovered. Okay. So, actually that's how she met my dad too. Well, that wasn't, she knew him already. She said she had had lots of boyfriends, but once she got TB, they all, you know, fell away pretty fast, <laughs> except for one. <laughs> he, he couldn't be kept away. So uh, that's how she ended up marrying him. That's the truth. Anyway, so now, so when I read Bright Star, I mean, obviously John Keats did not mean, he did not know about, you know, right? He didn't know about my mother, it was 200 years late, earlier, right? But for me, when I read Bright Star, all that story is there, right? You know? Um, and I'd like us to think about what that means. Because, again, of course, the simple question is, what does this have to do with teaching? You know? Um, does her story lead me to be moved when I read the poem? Of course, the answer is, that's what moves me most or at least my memory of that, or my unconscious memory of that. When I've taught this poem, did I ever tell my students this story I just told you, and maybe I shouldn't have told you? No, I've never mentioned it to them. Does it make, me, does it make the teaching of the poem better? Yes, it absolutely does. But how can I keep faith with my mother and that story when I teach thousands of miles away in Southern California? You know, in other words, how can I teach that truth them is the really interesting question. Now think about UC for a few minutes. It's an incredibly, we like to think of it as a state university system and all that, but it's actually an incredibly elite institution, right? There's how many, is it 40 million people in the state? And there are eight colleges, eight of these UC schools. It, we're not quite the 1%, and I'm talking about the students as well as the faculty, but we're certainly the top 5%, right? We are the state you know, elite. And what are we as professors and TAs and teachers? You know what we are? We're the gatekeepers for this kind of elite status. I mean, that is literally what we are. We're like the bouncers, you know? I was thinking of Mara Lago or whatever. We're like the bouncers. You know, you get in, you don't, etc., etc. Every time we grade, you know? Um, so, you know that sort of sentimental term, for example, first in her family to go to college? How does that all relate to what I was just talking about, for example? Right? To what extent are we inviting people into the kind of you know, elite in California, as we are? Some of them are already there, but we're inviting lots more of them in. 
on particular terms. What terms are we giving them a place in that top, say, five, six, seven percent? Well, I'll give you a few answers to that before I end. The first is, I think, they, we should always remember, and that goes back to kids, they have a right to high culture. You know? Uh, the culture of the pre-exist, of the elite already, should be theirs, right? You know, it's like, you know, I get these, uh, last weekend there was a, a, a brilliant girl, you know, a freshman in the seminar, I brought them to the art museum, and she said, you know, I've never been in an art museum before in my life, right? Working in the summer in Legoland. You know, they get Legoland, the, the top, the elite get the art museum, you know? Right? It's interesting. Now, when they get there, when they get to that art museum, of course, when they get to that poem, what do they find? And I guess I want, what I'd like to do is quote you a rather difficult piece of writing by a very well-known critic in our field, a German a Jewish uh, thinker in the 1930s called Walter Benjamin. And, and here's what he said, and, and this is a little difficult, so pay attention. It's very interesting, okay? And he's talking about, you know, you, you give the kids culture, what are you giving them, so to speak? It's like two minutes long. As in all previous history, whoever emerges as victor will participate in that triumph in which today's rulers march over the prostrate bodies of their victims. As is the custom, the spoils are borne aloft in the triumphal parade. These are called the cultural heritage. Okay? <coughs> this heritage finds a distanced observer in the person who's searching for truth. For such cultural riches, as he surveys them, everywhere betray a knowledge in which he cannot but contemplate with horror. They owe their existence, these poems and things, not merely to the toil of the great creators who produced them, and they were great, but equally to the anonymous forced labor of the latter's contemporaries. It's rather heavy going, but I hope you get the point. He ends by saying, there has never been a document of culture that is not at one and the same time a document of barbarism. Now, I don't know if that made any sense at all to anybody, <laughs> and I don't have time to explain it to you. <coughs> But it doesn't mean that we simply show up everything beautiful and everything magnificent in culture in the West that was produced by the elites for over 2,000 years, that we just showed up as a fraud, which is pretty easy actually to do most of the time. You know, I think really for me, on the contrary, what we should get the students to is to the point of familiarity where they indeed are moved by, you know, these works we put in front of them. And what that means then is that they accept it and they take it over as theirs. But not move to the point where it simply panders to their vanity. You know, where it tells them that they are wonderful because they have deep feelings, because they care for others. Um, you know, all those comfortable lies we tell ourselves, you know, as, as sort of good liberals in, in, in modern society. Right? Uh, no, rather what we need to do with the students is to get them to the point where once moved, they have a deeper insight. Right? You know, just think of the brilliant film. What happens when you come out of the cinema and you say, that was magnificent? Well, it made you feel deeply, but also somehow you realize there's more. There's something there that you, you've got an insight developed. Right? You know? an insight hopefully into the total world and then for them of their place and their possible roles in it. So you see how hard it is? Like teaching in one way is just breathing and talking. In another way, it's incredibly challenging and difficult to do all of that. But if you do it, it'll make you a great teacher. And indeed, it's not easy, but of course, you should always make it look as if it is. <laughs> I leave you with one pointer. To make yourself that teacher, I think, in a way, you always have to make yourself an outsider. There's a certain loneliness at the heart of teaching, I think. A, a kind of a bit of an emigrant, in a way, if you want to use what some people's minds today. 
So what I'm going to leave you with, because I like quoting things, as you've noticed, um, is just four lines of the greatest manifesto, perhaps, on leaving and on teaching and on immigration that I know of, which is the final lines of my own favorite, favorite book, perhaps, or one of them, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Do any of you know this? There's a few weird words in this, I'll tell you first. One of them is he ends with the word race. He doesn't mean race in the American sense. He just means like my people, but it says race. Anyway, it's a diary entry, and it's about the guy leaving. And it has a great description of teaching in the middle of it. Maybe you see. Uh, <coughs> he's leaving Ireland. He's going to become an immigrant. Mother is putting my new second-hand clothes in order. She prays now, she says, that away from home and friends, I will know what the heart is and what it feels. Amen. Welcome, O life. I go to encounter, for the millionth time, the reality of experience, and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Now there's the definition of teaching, to forge in the smithy of their souls the uncreated conscience of their people. They don't have a conscience yet, but you can give it to them. That's what I believe to be true, and that's the truth, and that's all I have to say to you, and I'm sorry I've kept you so long. Thanks very much. <laughs>